Good evening, everyone. We are now at the end of our study in the book of Leviticus. We're now in chapter 27. And then, this would be, and then, Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say this to them. Now we have always been looking at this book and many a times uh, may feel that you know, it, it doesn't really quite apply to non-Jews. And that's true because it is generally understood as the Torah Kohanim, is the instructions for the priesthood. But what is important is that although we have constantly reiterated the mantra, God's house, God's rules, God's land, God's rules, God's people, God's rules, the whole aspect of me trying to uh, drum it into us is to recognize that whatever belongs to God will and must be governed by His rules. Now, obviously, sometimes you may not fully appreciate or understand why some of these things are set in this particular manner, and mainly because it is actually meant for the Israelites, for them to follow. And I've constantly reiterated that there will be a lot of details that is not written down, which is commonly transmitted orally as what the Jews would call the oral Torah. And so we have what is written down as the written Torah, the details being in the oral Torah. And so when we struggle to uh, understand uh, how certain things are done, it's really not incumbent on us to pay that much attention to it. And so when we did this study in the book of Leviticus, and now we're at the very end, chapter 27, that I think we all need to understand and take one step back to appreciate that this entirety is to express the heart of God, His mind, His will, His rules, and through that, that we can appreciate the character of God. We have come thus far, and now in chapter 27, and we are now talking about things that is consecrated to God, things that is devoted to God. And there are Hebrew words that go around that that we will, we will look at, and about... Um, Redemption. Now, all of these terminology are, they are not English theological terms. We need to understand them as Hebrew words. So what did God want them to do? Right at the very end, remembering that these are for the priesthood, the Kohanim. The people must know because the people will be dealing with the priesthood. The priest must know because the priest must teach the people. And obviously, we would see the judges must know because there are rules that God wants the judges to judge fairly. And so justice is always part and parcel of all the instructions. So we begin in verse 2 when a man, and it's always a man uh, making vows. And so if he expresses a vow uh, with, with regards to arrangement of persons, now this is about arrangement and it affects people. Arrangement of certain nefesh. And this is a vow and, and by a vow really means a, a promise. 
This is a formal promise. And this is actually mentioned to God. And when it is about a dedication, then there is a concept of pledging these certain persons and they have a valuation. Now, what's the purpose of a valuation? The purpose of a valuation is that in the event that the person wants to change that promise, that these certain individuals are no longer consecrated. They are no longer arranged for the original promise. Now, this is important because God allows them to change their minds. This is about persons. This is about property. It is also about harvest and animals. This chapter is when somebody wants to set certain things apart, committed to God. And when that is done, as you know, God doesn't consume them. It will be given to the priesthood. And so these kinds of promise affects the Kohanim. And the person who makes those promises must know that in the event there is a requirement for whatever the reason to take it back, then there needs to be certain values and penalties and compensation to make the the uh, annulling of the promise uh, to be valid and to be fair. You can't just make a promise to God and, and treat it as if nothing was said. And so God wants the people to understand when you make a certain promise to God, then if you change your mind, then the people must know and there must be a judgment made on that. And the judgment is always based on valuation. And that's where we get this word, the valuation. Now, in this case, the valuation would be an arrangement of certain value, right? a certain shekel or a certain uh, amount of gold or silver. And so the valuation is now expressed. The arrangement or the valuation, as we call it right now, is really, uh, I won't say it's a price. Right? It's just a value tag in the event of a redemption. So there, the, the valuation is actually for the purpose of redemption. And we will talk about the redemption when we get to that word. And it goes this way. If your valuation of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, and these will be the functional male, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If the person is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. Now this is about people who are from 20 to 60 years old, male and female. These are assignments of value. This is not a sale of uh, a slave. If there is a child that you have vowed to set aside for God, but you want the child back, then if he is five years up to 20 years old, then your valuation for that child, if it's a male, to be 20 shekels. For a female, 10 shekels. Now, if it's from a month old up to five years old, which means that less than a month you cannot consecrate to God, then your valuation for a male shall be five shekels and for a female to be three shekels of silver. 
Now, if the person is 60 years and above, for a male, the valuation shall be 15 shekels, and for a female, 10 shekels. Please do not look at this as a gender bias. The valuation is really very much uh, associated at that time of functionality of a person, the male being out there in the community to own a certain number of responsibilities greater than the female. It is not about the ability or the knowledge or the education level. It is about a valuation tag as to what God would want for in exchange of a redemption sum. Now, it is important to understand that this entire chapter is about justice. It's about fairness. See, the middle name of God is just and fair. And so if the person needs to redeem, but the person is too poor. So in verse 8, we talk about the person's inability. So if he is too poor to pay your valuation of all this 15, 10, then you've got 3 and 5. Then you have 10 and 20. Then you have uh, 30 and 50. All of these valuation, and this person is unable to pay. He just can't lose the people committed. Then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall set a value for him. And according to the ability of him who vowed, the priest shall value him. So the priest actually makes a judgment to free him from his obligations. That is fairness. And the priest cannot uh, bind him to an impossible task. If this guide of valuation is just too much for this person, then there is an avenue, and this is what we call justice. And we need to be fair to a person who is poor. You cannot assume that everyone is of the same ability. We come to verse 9. Now, verse 9 talks about the cattle. The cattle, as in four-legged animals, if is an animal that men may bring as an offering to God, which we've read that in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. So all that anyone gives to the Lord shall be holy. Now what does that mean? It means that when you bring an animal for a sacrifice as an offering to God, that's it. The animal is set apart. He shall not substitute it or exchange it. Now this idea uh substitute or exchange. The idea of substitute is to come to swap. Come to swap it for something better. Exchange gives you the same idea of changing or altering. These are two Hebrew words with, with very similar meaning. And when it is brought to the tabernacle or the temple, that animal is considered holy. And so this person who brings can't change it out. And what does that mean? It means that you he wants to swap a good for a bad one or a bad for a good one, whatever that may be. There is no such rule. So remember, it is about rules that if he at all exchanges animal for animal. Now, when it comes to this point, the rule is that if he ever does exchange an animal for an animal, for example, an ox for an ox, then both 
of the animals, the one that is originally brought and the one that was changed, both are holy. What does that mean? It means that both will stay in the holy grounds. He cannot take it home. That, that's basically what it said. So you can't take it back as a substitute meaning. You can't bring an animal and swap out the original animal you brought. God's rules is that if you intend to swap it, both animals go to God. Now, if the animal is an unclean animal which they do not offer as a sacrifice to God. Now, sometimes we may miss some of these words and you might be wondering, why would there be an unclean animal to offer as a sacrifice to God? That, that can't be it, right? You can't be bringing a pig to the tabernacle or the temple. So what unclean really means is that basically it, it, it qualifies as a clean animal, but it was blemished, hence rendering the animal as unclean and therefore, therefore cannot be used as a sacrifice to God. And so the rule here is that he shall present the animal before the priest the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad, as it's you, the priest, value it and so shall be. And so if he wants at all to redeem it, and we now discuss this word, redeem. In verse 13, the idea of redeem first, the word is ga'al. Ga'al gives us a picture that something is returned to its original ownership. So let's say we have this and this was the original place. It is now moved to a different ownership. And so Ga'al would be to return to its original ownership owner. So this is Ga'al. Redemption. When the animal was brought to be an offering to God, then it shall be holy and it does not belong to him anymore. And so we have this instance, the person who brings it for offering, brings it to the temple or the tabernacle, and that's it. However, if he wants to take it back because it is unclean, something is wrong with the animal, and it cannot be offered as a sacrifice to God, then the priest who has taken it will place a value, just like the human value. This will be a value for this particular animal. and. This person, if he wants it back, must add one-fifth to your valuation. So if he says that it is 10 shekels, then one-fifth will be 12 shekels. That is what it means. That there needs to be uh, uh, interest because it used to belong to another party, and in this case, God, and the priest holds it for the Lord. Now, this whole principle is a principle of fairness and justice. In any business transaction, that would be the case. However, in an earlier chapter, and in, in Exodus chapter 23, for example, uh, when a person is poor and he borrows money, then you cannot charge an interest. But in a regular way, you can charge an interest. So you would take the base plus X percent, usually 20 percent. And so one fifth is the regular charges, 20 percent to the valuation. So you pay 
120% to redeem it. We now come to verse 14, where the man dedicates his house. Now, what does dedicate his house to be holy to the Lord? This means that he wants to make it special. He wants to make it holy. So, the idea of dedication is to make holy his house for God's purposes. Now, all of this is merely an association. Uh, but because of his fervor, his zeal and passion for the Lord, he makes that intent. Then when you do that, you are surrendering the use of the property for Jehovah. And then the priest shall put a value for it. Now, all the value is really the redemption value. Whether it is good or bad, the idea of good or bad means whether for whatever the reason may be, the priest will place a value and that will be the value to stand. And if this person wants to redeem his house back for his own purpose, then he must add 20% of the valuation and then it becomes his. So remember, it is all this 20%. And the redemption means this was his house. He assigns the house to be holy for God. And the priest will assign a value for it so that in the event that this original person says, hey, I want the house back because I have other purposes for it, you can redeem it plus 20% valuation. Verse 16. Now, verse 16 comes into contention of property. And you know, earlier when we were reading this, we have the concept of man who is unable to raise funds and he had to sell his land. And we come across the concept of the year of Jubilee, which is the 50 years and everything must be returned. And so if a man makes holy to God a field of his possession, of his inheritance, then your valuation shall be according to the seed for it. Now, this idea of the seed for it is about the valuation based on sowing seeds. It is not about the real estate property as we know it today, or uh, that certain parts of the country, certain valuation of the property will be higher uh, than others. The value of the property is about the ability to do agriculture. So an area which requires a homer of barley will be valued at 50 shekels of silver. And if he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, according to your valuation, it shall stand. So that will be a full period. But if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee, which means that it's shorter than the period, then the priest shall reckon to him the money due according to the years that remain until the year of Jubilee. And it shall be deducted from your valuation. Now, what does that mean? So it is important that whatever the value that is left uh, and a person wants to redeem it, whatever the, the, the period left will belong to the person who redeems it. But the period of time that he has dedicated, there is a value on that part of time. And so that is what it means that the priest shall reckon to him the money due according to years that remain until the year of Jubilee, and it shall be deducted from your valuation. 
So we have the year of Jubilee. And there was a period of time where he actually dedicated it. And if he, it was dedicated, then you find that there would be a time of redemption. So we'll say if this is the time of redemption, then this period of time would be redeemed for the person. And so the value would only be this value to pay. And so this is idea would be, and if he who dedicates a field wants to redeem it, then he must add one fifth to the money of your valuation and it will belong to him. So this valuation plus 20% will be the redemption sum because the future period of time has not been used and it cannot be considered a value. That, that is the principle uh, that is based on God's rules. Now, this has helped the person to not lose the function of the land. If he does not want to redeem the field or he has sold it to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. But the field, when it is released in the year of Jubilee, shall become the Lord's. As a devoted field, it shall be in the possession of the priest. If he does not redeem it, whatever happens after the year of Jubilee will stand as a holy open field. Now, in verse 21 and 22, we have a concept called haram. So let me just move this back to 21 and introduce you the concept of this word, haram. In verse 21, this word devoted is not to make holy, but I think devoted is a good way of expressing. It is something that is dedicated. But in this case, dedicated with the concept of being wrapped in a net that it cannot escape anymore. So this word is haram. Haram is about dedication and it's got two, two meanings. It is captured for, and it, it means captured. And so the word haram on the positive side is captured or dedicated to God. On the negative side, it really means uh, something that is assigned to be destroyed. It is a very peculiar word. Now, there are many Hebrew words like this. That, that one word can have a positive meaning and a negative meaning. And in this case, this word translated as devoted is haram. And it means captivated, captured. And so for good purposes, it's dedication. For bad purposes, it's captured to be destroyed. And so we continue in verse 22. If, if a man makes it haram to God, a field that he has bought. So sometime in the period of Jubilee, he went to buy this land and he says, I want this field to be dedicated to God. I want it locked in. So it's not about making holy, but it is about making it haram. Now, which is not the field of his possession. He bought it from somebody else. Then the priest shall reckon to him the worth of your valuation up to the year of Jubilee, and he shall give your valuation on the day as a holy offering to God. That means that this part here, this part here, would be 
the valuation of this person who bought it. And that would be dedicated to God. So in the year of Jubilee, the field shall return to him from whom it was bought because he bought it from somebody else to the one who originally owned the land as a possession. And all your valuation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. 20 gera to the shekel. So to be fair, this person owns the field. He sold it to another person. And this new owner can only own it temporarily. And this person dedicates it to God. And so for this period until the year of Jubilee, it could be used by the Kohanim. But when the year of Jubilee comes, the, the property reverts back to the original owner. That is fair. That is just. So that when the person is poor and is forced to sell, he will never permanently lose his inheritance. Come to verse 26. Now, verse 26 deals with the core. That would be the firstborn. Now, if you go back to read Exodus chapter 13, for example, you find that all firstborn belongs to God. Firstborn of animals, firstborn of humans, and the core firstborn would be the first issue of the womb. First issue of womb. Whether animals or humans. And God says it belongs to him, which should be the Lord's firstborn. No man shall dedicate. Now this idea, no man shall dedicate, means... You can't take something that is holy to God and to make it holy some more. You, you can't just do it because it doesn't belong to you. Whether an ox or a sheep, it has already belonged to God. Now, if it is an unclean animal, again, the word unclean means it was originally clean, but for some reason it is considered blemished. Then he shall redeem it according to your evaluation, which is the priest evaluation. Add 20% to it. And if it's not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. So now you find that if you redeem, you add 20%. If you don't redeem, you sell it according to the base value that you have assigned. So that the priest does it because it is dedicated to God. We're now in our final passage of Numbers 27, which is also the last passage of the book of Leviticus. Verse 28 says this, Nevertheless, no haram. And this is haram. Nothing that is haram that you've assigned uh, already to God, both man and beast, feel, shall be sold or redeemed. Now, this is important. If it is haram, it is captivated. Think of it as captured. And we use the word devote for God. It is locked up for God. If that is the case, you cannot sell and you cannot redeem it. Every haram, you can call it haram offering, is most kadosh. Now, this word most holy means it is the holy of all holy things. The holy of holies is the haram offering because it is not just set aside to be special. In this case, there is a process. Now, we're not told the process, but there is a process where 
One is just called basically Kadosh as an offering to God. Leviticus chapters 1 to 7. Another is Haram, where it is captivated and it cannot be sold. And so classification is important. Remember, God's house, God's rules. And if you do that, it belongs to God and nobody can touch it. So no person under the haram who may be doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Now, this is something that you need to be very careful. Verse 29 is about haram. A person can be haram when a person is in a death penalty. You see this? A person who is haram to destruction. And this word here, a person who is haram to be haram. So understand this. A person who is haram, dedicated to be haram. The same word is in the negative meaning. And it is to be captured for destruction by the courts of men for the crimes that he has committed. God says, to be very fair, he shall not be redeemed. He must surely be put to death. He cannot be redeemed. Now, what does that mean? Think of it this way. When the lower courts have, have decided that this person is to be stoned, he is to be executed for the crime that he has done, that he deserved, that person is said to be haram in the negative way that he is now captivated and captured, but it's not for God. He's captured because of the crimes he has done, and so he cannot be bailed out or bought out. He must be put to death. There is no loophole when a man is haram to die. Maybe he has killed somebody intentionally. Uh, there are at least two witnesses, and he is dedicated a haram to be killed. God says such persons cannot be redeemed. There is no back door to save this person. If he has to be killed, he has to be killed. That is what it means. And so verse 29 must be seen in very careful terms. Redemption is not a back door to things that must be executed. When a person must die from execution, that person cannot have a back door to consecrate him because God will not want him and he cannot be redeemed, nor can he be uh, sold. So you can't take a person who is haram for death to be dealt with in any other way except dying. We look at verse 13. This is all the tithe of the land. Remember the tenth. This is the tenth. The tithe must be remembered that it's actually for the Kohanim. It's for the the, the priests, the Levites. It is not a, 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 a transaction. And so the tithe of the land, and tithe is always about the produce, whether the seed of the land, the fruit of the tree, it belongs to God. That is what it means in verse 30. It is holy to God. It is set apart for God. That's what it means. It is holy to God. It is special to God. And if a man wants at all to redeem any of the tithes, he shall add 20% to it. 
So it's to be fair for some reason you want it, you pay for it, redeem it. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, whatever passes under the rod, meaning you count the number of animals and this year, oh, we've got one more. Uh, so a tenth of it will go to the Levites and the tenth shall be holy to God. He shall not inquire whether it's good or bad. He cannot exchange it. And if he does exchange, well, the rule is both the one exchange and the original one shall be holy. Both cannot be taken back. Both must belong to God. Now, after all this said and done, God is just wanting them to realize that even in the event, that there is a process of redemption, exchanges, sale. There are rules. And the Levites must know, the people must know, and the judges especially must know. Now the priest must know because the priest is dealing with all these things. One, that is set apart for God, and two, that is haram for God or haram by the courts to be killed. So all of these is in chapter 27. Now, what is so important is that we need to understand and recognize that God is fair. God is just. It describes that in the event that he wants to take it back, you can, but there's a 20% adjustment on it. If it's the land, it needs to be dealt with with the time of the Jubilee. If it's not the original owner, then the original owner must have it back. So all of these, although you see it as rules and laws and whatever you may call it, it reflects the heart of God. If it's too poor, then the priest must find a way to allow him to redeem. See, God's middle name is justice and fairness. God will not penalize. And so the priest now holds the key. How to be fair? And it is not stated here. Uh, doesn't mean that when God says it's 50 shekels, that he can say that it is five shekels. Well, the priest will know the ability of this person and must assign it in such a way that this person will be able to redeem. Otherwise, he might as well stay with the number because he can't take it at, at all. He has no ability. So the middle name of all the transactions that we read in Leviticus chapter 27 is fairness. If a man who is haram to die because that he has killed somebody, he cannot be redeemed because that will not be fair. Because the judgment is that he must pay for his life then he cannot be redeemed, he cannot be sold. He cannot be treated with a back door to escape death. That is fair. That is justice. So I just want us to understand that this entire passage is about God's character. These are the commands which God had given Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 to 24, and they stayed there for a year until the book of Numbers. And so I think it is important for us to realize that we don't get bogged down by the laws, but we take a step back to see the heart and the character of God, how he is just, how he is fair, and how he gives rules that always considers a person's financial ability, also a person's inheritance of the land. And so at the end of the day, while rules are set so that there is order, there is harmony, that the priests know what to do, well, at the end of the day, it is to look at God and give him the glory that he has imparted wisdom and he gives the priests the empowerment 
to execute justice for the poor. Now, if the priest doesn't do that, then obviously God will come after him. And so justice or injustice is not a crime, but God will come after the injustice of the people. And those who are in power must execute the laws according to justice. And so with this, we come to the end of chapter 27 and also the end of the book.